Hi. Uh, I'm Nathan Piagatico. The title of my grand rounds is Healing with Feeling. Dr. Galore is my faculty discussant. We have no financial disclosures. We have no financial disclosures to declare. <laughs> So our case begins with the chief complaint of redness in the right eye. It's a 95-year-old male with a prior episode of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. He presents with recurrent episodes of redness and poor vision in the right eye. History, past ocular history, herpes zoster in the right eye uh, in 2010, a right upper lid entropion. Past medical history is notable for hypertension, presbycusis, Past surgical history, he had a, a cataract extraction in the right in 2013, along with the right uh, upper lid marginal rotation in 2011 for the entropion. Family history is non-contributory. Medications, he's on valcyclovir uh, intermittently and artificial tears. Exam, visuality, counting fingers at five feet, 20-40 vision in the left eye. ILP was 6 and 14. Pupils are equally round and reactive. External exam was normal. Would Dr. Levitt like to dis, uh, describe this photograph? Sure. <laughs> um, don't see much of the lids or lashes, but the conjunctiva appears injected um, with some corneal Panis 360, uh, paracentrally there is um, an epi defect staining with fluorescein. Um, there appears to be an infiltrate underneath and the defect has somewhat rolled borders. Um, AC, deep informed, unable to really assess for cellar flare. And we have one other photograph. Um, it looks like there's some Stromal thinning, maybe 30% difficult to judge exactly. Yep, exactly. So on the right eye, we had uh, MGD to one injectation on the lids. There's three plus injection. There's a one by 1.8 millimeter corneal epi defect with about 40% stromal loss. 360 superficial corneal neovascularization. AC was actually deep and quiet. There was no cellar flare. Iris round and flat. Um, and there was PCI oil in the bag. The left eye was remarkable for a uh, a cataract. And then posterior segment exam was grossly normal. So do we have a differential? Um, so for a corneal ulcer, essentially um, infectious at the top of the list, bacterial, um, but in his case with a history of um, uh, herpes, basically herpetic would also be up there. Um, it could also be secondary and, and to exposure, um, neurotrophic ulcer, limbal stem cell deficiency. Yep. So at a very similar list, so we have a corneal ulcer. Causes uh, include infection, neuropathy, limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, he could also have a connective tissue or autoimmune disease, although he doesn't have any known diagnoses. Um, so things that we think about, um, PUK is usually more peripheral, although if you had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you could think about paracentral ulcers, particularly in the setting of dry eye. Uh, there's no scarring of the fornices to suggest any other uh, diseases, processes. He did have the history of the entropion, but uh, no entropion or ectropion on exam. As far as infection, there were no dendrites, pseudodendrites, satellite lesions, or any AC cell. Um, although, again, um, you know, it's kind of infection until proven otherwise. So top of our differential would be kind of a neurop and uh, a neuropathic ulcer, limbal stem cell deficiency, or in some type of infection or super infection. And these are not all mutually exclusive. So oh. <laughs> any additional tests that you would like to perform? Um, I think obtaining cultures would be useful. Exactly. So we'd get cultures. We wait for the cultures to come back. But in the meantime, we can also perform um, um, corneal sensitivity testing, uh, which we could use a Cochet Bonnet estheometer. But since we're at the VA for this patient, and these are uh, you know, not particularly clean, uh, we use floss instead. <laughs> and so um, instead of using the estheometer, we use a, a six uh, centimeter or a millimeter piece of floss to just poke at the eye. 
and his sensation was absent on the right and reduced on the left. And we also have an anterior segment OCT. Um, it looks like at the area of the um, thinning that we saw previously, well, it's re-demonstrated here on OCT with some, I guess, infiltrate also in that area. Yep. So um, re-demonstrated about 40% from a loss. There seems to be some underlying hyperreflectivity. This could potentially be an infiltrate. So our initial therapy, we treated it as a neuropathic ulcer but with the possibility that there could be an infection as well. So it's restarted on valicyclovir. He's placed on polytrim, serum tears, an amniotic membrane, and a bandage contact lens. And a bit later, we got microbiology back, which showed no organisms on the gram stain, chocolate blood, seborrhoids, a thioglycolate showed no growth. So uh, our discussion will be about neurotropic keratopathy. The objectives of this talk are recognize the causes of NK, improve staging and management of NK, and incorporate new treatment options into the management. So causes. So corneal sensation supplied by the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve uh, via the long ciliary uh, uh, nerves, and uh, lesions anywhere along this pathway can cause uh, neurotropic keratopathy, beginning from brainstem lesions to trigeminal lesions to ciliary nerve lesions, to ocular nerve lesions, which can occur with enthusiastic PRP, um, and corneal nerve lesions from cases like ours, where there's um, herpetic keratitis or VZV keratitis. It could also be LASIK or chemical injuries, contact lens wear, or even just anesthetic drops or topical medications. Uh, other additional causes include diabetes, which affect the nerves everywhere in the body, and pars plana vitrectomy. Most commonly, it's herpes. So NK develops in about 6% of herpes keratitis and about 12.8% of herpes zoster keratitis. Since herpes keratitis is more commonly seen, uh, it is the most common cause. So pathogenesis. Um, so first we have loss of innervation of uh, the cornea, which leads to a decreased sig signaling to the lacrimal functional unit. And as a result, we have decreased tearing, def decreased blinking. Uh, we next have loss of limbal, limbal stem cell migration onto the cornea, which causes the epithelium to age without getting replenished and become irregular. The tear film that does exist rapidly evaporates, um, leaving us a uh, what's called a stage one ulcer where the corneal epithelium is now irregular, but there's no frank uh, staining or epi loss. The temperature along the cornea uh, drops as uh, the tear film evaporates. Cold thermoseps uh, sensors are activated uh, and the nociceptors are uh, subsequently <laughs> activated, um, causing further inflammation uh, and the release of uh, pro-inflammatory substances, including endothelin, substance P, and neurokinin A, and probably most significantly, um, matrix metalloproteinases, which then chew up the epithelium leading us to a stage two ulcer where you can start seeing epi loss, persistent epi loss, along with rolled up edges along the borders of the ulcer. And then subsequently uh, stromal loss, uh, which is a stage three ulcer, which you can see here and in our patient. So the first step in treatment is actually just recognize the disease early on. So one and a half years ago, this was the patient. Um, as you can see here, he has an ulcer uh, that's beginning. Uh, it's much smaller, uh, maybe a stage two or an early stage three where you see the rolled up edges um, and maybe a, a little bit of stromal loss. And then the next step is recognizing the cause and treating the underlying cause. So there are certainly slow evolving causes of, um, or sorry, there's uh, causes that um, are slow evolving. So Post PPV or PRP or LASIK, these typically, the ulcers will progress slowly, um, whereas there are also causes that um, lead to more aggressive neurotropic keratopathy, including um, viral infections, chemical injury, or brainstem or uh, nervous system lesions. So the goals of therapy include improving the environment for uh, the cornea, 
decreasing inflammation, minimizing the risk of superinfection, providing a scaffold for re-epithelialization, minimizing exposure, and then restoring the neurons. So things that we can do, we can place serum tears, avoid preservatives or anesthetics. We can place an amniotic membrane and give doxycycline to decrease the inflammation. We can give antibiotics like polytrim to minimize the risk of superinfection. Uh, we can place a bandaged contact lens in another amniotic membrane uh, to provide a scaffold. And then we minimize exposure by forming a temporary trisorphy. And then the final one is restoring the neurons. And we have a couple new avenues to do this currently. So um, this is something that we discussed during our orbital dissection course. Um, for uh, upstream lesions, we can perform, uh, this, this is an investigational uh, procedure, but we can perform a sural nerve graft where we uh, co-op the contralateral uh, supratrochlear nerve and bring it over to uh, the cornea on the affected side. And then we also have uh, new drops, which uh, our corneal specialists can prepare or uh, prescribe. So um, this is a preclinical study showing that nerve uh, growth factor promotes no nerve growth in uh, post-LASIK mouse corneas. So we have here uh, on the right side, um, uh, uh, post-LASIK uh, cornea at uh, eight weeks treated with just BS, uh, BSS, where you can see that there's loss of uh, the nerve density and the anterior stroma. And then on the um, other side, we have uh, 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 a confocal microscopy of the, a nerve treated with uh, mouse nerve growth factor with increased nerve cell density. And this has now been made into a drug um, so and has recently been approved for treatment of neurotrophic keratopathy. So uh, Senegermin is a recombinant human nerve growth factor. Uh, the repair trial is a phase two clinical trial, which showed that after eight weeks of treatment, uh, there was resolution in, uh, of um, uh, epithelial defects in 74.5% of patients who were treated with Senegermin, while uh, those treated with just artificial tears only got 43.1%. Uh, and their definition of resolution was a fluorescence standing less than 0.5 millimeters. Side effects included eye pain, abnormal sensation of the eye, or excess lacrimation, photophobia, eyelid pain, which they cited as uh, actually indication that the um, nervous sensation was uh, improving. It's a little expensive at $19,000 for the eight week course. So inclusion for this trial was unilateral stage two or three neurotropic keratopathy, refractory to one or more previous conventional non-surgical treatments, Tarsorophy was an exclusion criteria, and then treatments consisted of six drops a day at two different concentrations, and the control was a, just artificial tears. And you can see here at eight weeks, 74.5% were healed versus the 43.1% in the control, and at 56 weeks, their recurrence rate was 3 to 5%. So our case revisited, uh, an amniotic membrane was placed. He was given serum tears, valacyclovir, polytrim, Three days later, his vision had improved to 2400. The epi defect was beginning to consolidate. Subsequently, one week later, his vision was improved to 2200. Epi defect had closed. And then one month later, his visual acuity was 2100. Some pictures. This is day three. His eye still looks rather angry, but the epi defect is closing. And you can see the amniotic membrane in place. And then one month later, his eye is more quiet. Um, the amniotic membrane is still in place, although there's uh, beginning of some stromal loss.